What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the channel. This has been a really tough week. I think it's been a tough week for everyone in America. There's been a lot to talk about, a lot to think about. I did not want to post anything last week. I just wanted to give myself the space to kind of reflect, be a compassionate listener, take in what was going on in our country, and uh, really consider the black experience in ways I hadn't ever considered it before, consider my own life, just, just think, just process. And um, I wanted to give other people the chance to do that too, but you know, I feel like we've all been overwhelmed at different times just seeing kind of the, the discourse and the anger and the, some of it really good, some of it really nasty, and, and maybe just we need to talk about some music. You know, Ultimately, that's how I view this platform. It is just a place where I talk about country music. This was going to be a month where we got new albums from the Dixie Chicks and Margot Price and Luke Bryan, but there's been a lot of albums that have been delayed due to the shutdown and due to the fact that touring and promotion really isn't able to happen. So there's a smaller batch of albums, but still a pretty eclectic bunch of albums that I want to talk about today. And the first one I want to mention is the new album from Jason Isbell in the 400 unit called Reunions. To see how long that you could sit with the truth, but you bail. Going into Reunions, I wasn't especially excited for this album because I thought some of the pre-release tracks lacked some energy. And definitely my main criticism of this album is that it feels like it takes a minute to get going. Like, What Have I Done to Help is a beautiful message about wanting to show solidarity. You know, it's really appropriate for this time, but I feel like it just kind of goes on and on and it lacks the punch of something like be afraid. But I think that this album is a grower. It has really grown on me with every single listen. And I think the back half of the album especially is just stellar, incredible songwriting that very few people other than Jason Isbell can really do. On a summer night in a I will say on the front half of the album, Dreamsicle, I think is such a standout song. It's kind of just painting a picture of a southern front yard and a kid standing with a dream sickle and there's all this brokenness around him but there's just this simple image of innocence of this kid with a dream sickle that I think is really beautiful about kind of the innocence of childhood against the brokenness of the world. And Jason is constantly exploring this idea of brokenness. He even revisits sobriety on a song near the end of the album called It Gets Easier which is saying, you know, it gets easier to be sober but it doesn't get easy. Life is really hard. And there's also the very broken main character of the song River, which is definitely my favorite track on the whole album. River is my savior, only one I'll ever need. Wash my head when I've been sinning. And it's so weird. It sounds gentle and spiritual and even influenced a little bit by gospel. And it's got very religious language talking about the river as his savior. And at first I thought this was him sort of saying that his worldview has shifted from maybe the Southern Christian upbringing that he had and he has more of a naturalist take on the world. But really this is a hidden murder song. You know, he's talking about how the things that he's done and the blood from his knuckles are getting washed away and how it's carrying secrets and bodies away from him when he puts them in the river. And then ultimately at the end of the song, he puts himself in the river. So it ends in a suicide and it's really strange because it's so pretty and gentle. It's for sure one of the most unique songs I've heard on any album this year. But what I actually think might end up being the standout track from the whole record, just because it's a lot more easy to digest, is the final song, which is called Letting You Go, which is a father's love letter to his daughter. And it's about how being a father to this girl is easy, but it's going to be so hard letting her go. And I'm just imagining either this song becomes a hit for him or some big country artist covers it and it becomes a standard that plays at every wedding during the father-daughter dance ever. You know, it's just really sweet. Jason's such a good writer that sometimes his words are almost a little cryptic for me. Like it took me forever to figure out what Only Children was about and to put together that it was about, you know, two friends, one of whom died. There's times like that where I'm like, man, this is like really thoughtful music and that's not a fault of it. And in a way, it kind of is a fault of it sometimes if you can't follow the story so easily. And I definitely wish the sequencing on the album was a little bit differently because like I said, I think it's a slow ramp up to get into kind of the energy of the album. But once you're there, it's really, really good. Good. So I think I'd give this like a seven and a half or an eight out of ten, something like that. And then we got the new album from Kip Moore called Wild World. 
Kim Moore is someone that gets compared to Bruce Springsteen a lot for his kind of heartland rock sound, and that is definitely a vibe that you're gonna hear on Wild World. But I actually think this album isn't really some 80s rock album at all. I think it's a good deal more atmospheric than that, and I think actually the moments when it gets really atmospheric are by far the strongest on the record. And the moments that are more just kind of straightforward, groove-based rock are really not that groovy. Like, I would say the lead single, She's Mine, and another song called Grow On You feel the clunkiest on this album to me. But when it gets moodier and when it gets into this kind of darker energy where Kip is exploring if he's good or if he's bad, he feels like it's a wild world, but he's trying to do his best. That's where this stuff all really works. And as you guys know, that's kind of a vibe in Eric Church's music that I really resonate with. I just like when people are struggling in that way to figure out where they stand, what they believe, and yet are continuing to go forward through life. Well, you want to keep running. You get some heartbreak on this record, and it's bookended by a song called Janie Blue about a girl that got away. And she's kind of brought back up near the end of the record on a song called Payin' Hard that is the lyrical standout of the whole album. Over top of a really complex picked acoustic guitar, and he's saying, you know, my life's a credit card, play now, pay later, and I'm paying hard. He's basically kind of looking back and saying, I regret some of the things that I've done that have led me to feeling restless and being alone. And it's not just his relationship, it's also reflecting on his career and his relationship with his late father. He's kind of got this outsider complex and he's a little bit of a vagabond and you hear that on songs like Southpaw and another song called South, which shout out to South for being the instrumental moment of the record. I mean, the end of that song just explodes in the best way. My favorite song on the record is called Fire and Flame. If you're looking for me tonight, I'll be out here burning bright somewhere between the fire it's almost a spiritual exploration. It actually reminds me of stuff that Kenny Chesney says a lot when he's thinking about how everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. Kip Moore is essentially saying the same thing in a much more serious way, trying to figure out what is true and you know, how do I find peace and the fact that I have this reckless spirit inside of me, but I still hope there's room on the train that's going to heaven. Normally, you're gonna find me out partying somewhere between the fire and flame, which I guess is sort of a hellscape imagery. But from a fun to sing along and catchiness perspective, I think the hit on this album is probably Red, White, Blue, Jean, American Dream. It's better than you might think based on that title. This is not some bro song just about jeans. It's kind of a love letter to Americana and to all the different places in America where iconic artists have been. He says, Dylan went to New York, Cash went to Nashville, Mark Twain floated on the Mississippi Queen. Whereas sometimes his wandering spirit leads him to angst, this is like a really fun version of wandering. I almost wish there were a few more obvious just hooks, just really fun to sing along with things, but that kind of rock brooding atmosphere is the vibe of that record. It's not kind of big songs like something about a truck, but moving forward, I would love if there was some way to kind of merge those two things. But on the whole, I still really liked it. I think I'd give it a seven out of 10. I want to talk about two EPs really quickly. The first one is Florida Georgia Line six pack EP. I love my country. I love I'm not going to talk much about this because the reality is I really, really disliked it and I'm not in a mood to be in a bad mood. I just want to feel happy and talk about stuff I like. My favorite song on this record is I Love My Country and I only liked that song. U.S. Stronger is my favorite of the new songs, but in general it feels like they kind of went for this more mature vibe on Can't Say I Ain't Country, their last album, but when it didn't have the sales power they kind of like reverted back to party tunes. and these aren't that thoughtful of party tunes. Like Beer 30, I know it's supposed to be tongue in cheek and dumb, but it's just dumb, you know, be tongue in cheek and smart. Cause it's Beer 30 and it's time to party. Yeah, baby. We've all kind of been on the journey of rethinking why did we dislike Florida Georgia Line so much and kind of opening our minds to being like, we were being too harsh, but then this album, it's like all the stereotypes of what Florida Georgia Line was like got turned up to 25. And also just an update for the people that thought I Love My Country sounded a lot like short skirt weather. 
The songwriters for Kane Brown's Short Skirt Weather were added on to the songwriting credits of this track when the EP came out. So I don't know what the whole story is there, what went down, but apparently, yeah, they did sound pretty similar. Now, a more successful pop country EP, I would argue, is Jordan Davis's new EP. I went to church in a Chevy on a two lane on the side of the road. Now, Jordan Davis is definitely one of the poppier country artists in the pop country world, but there seems to be a certain level of comfort with that, and I think the production on this actually sounds really nice and tasteful. Paul DiGiovanni produced it. He's also worked on super country albums like Justin Moore's uh, Late Nights and Long Necks, which I really loved last year. There are two main standout tracks on this record. Church in a Chevy is one of them. It's kind of almost like his version of my church. It is about being in a car and just finding God out in nature, but the delivery of it is beautiful. I think a ton of people will relate to that song. It's kind of like the new Larry Fleet, Where I Find God song. There's a lot of Christians in country music that are finding God out on their own in a car right now, but I do think it's a gorgeous song. I think it's gonna be a smash. And the other one, and my favorite, is called Detours. Look at me wrong, you damn right I'd fight you. parents got the voice kind of dog. And it's about uh, the broken road that led to his current wife. And I think this album's a good example of pop country goes down a lot easier when there's more substance in the words. You know, it's easy to hear a party song when you're hearing something super thoughtful like that at the same time. I don't think that makes songs like Cool Anymore or Ruin My Weekend inherently interesting, but it definitely just makes for a better package overall. Before I kind of travel out to the Texas scene, I also wanted to mention Sarah Evans has a cover album out called Copy That. It's fun as an experiment if you're a big Sarah Evans fan. It almost feels like a variety show from the 70s or 80s and it's a little bit more orchestral. My two favorite songs on the album are definitely her cover of I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry which kind of really fleshes out the chorus of that Hank Williams classic and then the album closer Hard To Say Sorry which will really take you on a musical journey. Apparently this is a big song that she does at encores but I, um, I really enjoyed that as well. So check it out, it's fun. Then let's talk about the new album from Randy Rogers and Wade Bowen, Hold My Beer, Volume 2. She didn't just leave you, she left you for audio cloud. Now Randy and Wade are two of the big names out in the Texas country scene. They put out this beloved album a few years ago called Hold My Beer, and this is a follow-up to that. And if you like the sounds of classic country music, if you like a lot of steel and a lot of fiddle, and I know you do, you're gonna enjoy this record. It sounds beautiful, and there's all these moments in which they're kind of paying tribute to country music on songs like Rhinestone, which is a co-write with Laurie McKenna, and you think of the rhinestone nudie suits of country music past, or on songs like Let Merle Be Merle, about kind of respecting tradition. Elsewhere on the album, you get sort of sillier moments. You get things like Warm Beer and Mi Amigo, and the lead single off the project, Rodeo Clown, which kind of gets into some fun Texas dynamics where the guy's like, I could take it if she left me for some strapping cowboy or someone really cool, but she left me for a rodeo clown, just some poser. And you get into more of those dynamics on something like This Ain't My Town. Don't blame me. It could be seen as a little bit of an indictment of Austin, Texas for becoming this sort of hipper than thou city, or it could be seen as an indictment of the city of Nashville and that whole music scene. And so it's kind of them saying like, we're building our own thing out here in Texas, which is an attitude that a lot of the Texas artists have and good for them. They're doing it their own way out in Texas. And that's kind of a theme on this record as well. If there's a strength to the album and a weakness at the same time, it's that it's all kind of silly. None of this feels like it costs the artist very much. It feels like fun bar tunes and you do get a vibe of friendship that makes this album really fun to listen to, if a little bit light. Still, it goes down freaking easy. It's like just, pop in little mini marshmallows in your mouth, one after the other. It's very enjoyable, it's got great production on it, a beautiful country sound. I really enjoy it, it's probably somewhere in like, upper sevens, the upper sevens we'll say. The next two albums I wanna talk about, I'm gonna be pretty quick on. I've only listened to each of them two times cause like I said, I've been thinking and talking about a lot of other stuff, but normally I'll listen to an album like five times before I talk about it here. The first is John Bauman's Country Shade. Times are always changing. Are the good times gone? 
Now, John Bauman is a songwriter from Texas that I absolutely love. He's one of the members of the Panhandlers. As I've always said on this channel, I found him through Kenny Chesney's Gulf Moon. And I think because that was my introduction to him and then he was on this Panhandlers album that's kind of a love letter to this place of Texas, I really associate him with being an amazing songwriter in capturing the details of a place. And that's not really what Country Shade is about. This album is much more fatherly in a way. It's much more brotherly, maybe you might say. It's kind of wise and patient and reflecting on the world around him. And it's really gentle and beautiful. The first song, The Country Doesn't Sound the Same, is about how the sound of country music is changing, as is rural life and kind of our understanding of it. On another song like Next Lap Around the Sun or Next Ride Around the Sun, he's just saying like, do your best. Kind of reminds me of like a Lori McKenna, people get old type feeling. Just like, let's do our best on the next lap around the sun. And he's got a sense of family on songs like Grandfather's Grandson, but there are some upbeat moments too. I really enjoy his twist on the idea of Sunday morning coming down with Sunday morning going up. Like, let's have a good time tonight before the come down that comes later. I actually really love the song Daylight's Burning. But this looks for you. Yeah, I like to about sitting with someone that's in pain and it's like you know I know you're hurting at the end of this relationship uh, I know this sucks right now but like the world is still spinning and and I know you can do it I know you can get through this if you like stuff that's quiet and contemplative and thoughtful and patient this is a great album for you now maybe on the other side of the spectrum we got Jamie Wyatt I really like her on this new album Neon Cross badass you know from the little bit I've read about her she's lived a lot of life you know she grew up in LA she was married she had uh, some addiction issues she was in prison she has since you know divorced and come out and there's like a lot of pain and I think that comes through in the lyrics but so does a really plucky attitude and she's tough and cool Shooter Jennings produced this record and he's an amazing producer if you like the type of production that American Aquarium has on their albums with you know really tasteful steel with space for a big voice to kind of bellow you're gonna have that on this album too my favorite songs in the album are probably neon cross which just rocks i really like the song goodbye queen what a bad love makes you weak this song kind of merges humor with that little bit of shame and self-loathing that's so present in a lot of country music and she's like if you want a lover that leaves i'll be your goodbye queen like there's this sort of pitiful but humorous take on herself there. A less humorous take is the last song on the record that's the other big standout that's Demon Tied to a Chair in My Brain, which is kind of like an anxiety anthem, I would say, you know? We've all felt that, like, tortured by some little idea or demon that we can't get out of our brain. And for someone that's been through some of the things that Jamie Wyatt's been through, it reads as really real. I'm not gonna give either of those albums a score right off the bat, but I think they're both really solid in their own way. They're each kind of a patient take on the world, but it just manifests really differently. I wanted to include two more records on this video that I've only done the most cursory listen to. That's the new record from Hellbound Glory, which at first listen I really liked, as well as the new record from Mike and the Moon Pies, which is a tribute album to Gary Stewart. I would need to do more of them, but at first listen, they both sound real freaking nice. Also check those out. They're on my radar too. I probably just am going to be too behind to do a full review on them. I'll be back with some more videos soon. And until then, stay safe out there. Be kind. Listen to one another. I love you. That's all. That's all I'm saying. I love you.